<clears throat> Hello, how's everybody doing today? I hope you are doing uh, fine. We are going to finish up the uh, population section today and then uh, get into, I can't remember what chapter is next. I think it's food and agriculture, which is good. All right, I like that, uh, that selection. All right, so we went through demographics last time, how we look at uh, populations. You use little what's called histograms or pyramid uh, graphs and talked about what a population was and all that stuff. So this time we are going to talk about what happens when humanity transitions um, or grows their population, I'd say, or transitions into what's called a developed nation, all right? But uh, and, and by population ch changes, how do populations change over time, all right? And first we need to know that population change result from births and deaths and immigration and immigration, right? So... When we look at the population size, we look at the births and the deaths, and we subtract them from the immigration. Uh, and we, we look at the births and the immigration of people that are born in the United States and the people that migrate into the United States. And we subtract that from the death and the immigration, the people that die in the United States and the people that leave the United States for another country. And that gives us our population uh, numbers. And that's going to be what... Um, you'll normally see all right sometimes we do what's called a, the crude population uh rate which is just the births and deaths of the naturalized citizens already all right and we don't worry about this immigration and immigration and a matter of fact here in the united states if we didn't have immigration coming in our natural uh, birth and death rate is actually uh, not meeting what's called replacement value um, we would have a negative growth rate here in the United States if it wasn't for um, the immigration we, we allow into our nation. Um, but that's another here nor there. A uh, global decrease uh, of infant mortality rates. That has probably been one of the biggest uh, gainers when it comes to population. I mean, that really influenced our population growth rate dramatically. All right. And the frequent and then the infant mortality rate is a frequency of children dying in infancy, usually typically about till three years old, all right? Sometimes it'll be a little bit younger. It depends on the stat, all right? But typically when you think about this number, you just think they have to live till three, and then they're out of that stage, okay, on a general basis. Um, but look, if you see a stat, see what that cutoff is, okay? Uh, and they have played a large role in population growth because we have like, uh, you know, our infant mortality rate right now, I think it's probably around one point seven or something like that so it's pretty good i'll have to i'll have to check it out but it's pretty good unfortunately it's going up it's not as good as other developed nations all right but you know having kids was like thought of as insurance all right it was going to help the families have workers on the farm and um, a source of income when they get older or someone's going to take care of you you know i want my daughter she's already ready to take care of me when i'm older she's going to move me out of you know i live on a farm she's going to build me a nice little it's called an earthship, and I'll just retire in my earthship. And she'll have the, the big farmhouse for her and her family. But you know, hey, that's why I have kids, right? Um, and when we were younger, you know, during the little house in the prairie times and earlier, we didn't have all the good nutrition and fight disease and all this other stuff uh, for the pregnant woman to have to, to deliver a healthy baby. And a lot of times those babies did not make it. So women would have five, six, seven children um, give birth to that many children, but only like two or three would survive. Okay. And that's why we did it. All right. And there's other things, you know, there's pro, pro what what's called pronatal pressures. All right. And we also, you know, want to carry on the family name and all that other uh, stuff. Okay. But basically the, you know, the ability for our medical abilities to keep us alive and uh, longer uh, has really helped out. Okay, the infant mortality rates are close, closely tied to the nation's uh, level of industrialization. Okay, so China, for example, saw an infant mortality rate uh, drop from 47 children per uh, thousand lives, a thousand births in 1980 to 16 in a thousand in uh, 2013. This is great. I mean, I want those children to. Uh, live longer, and that also puts pressure on their uh, overall 
population growth rate. It will take some time for that to decrease, but once the people have confidence that their children are going to make it, they're not going to have those seven children anymore. They're just going to have those two or three. All right. Um, but we'll see that as we go through that demographic transition coming up here in a little bit. All right. We're going to see here blue. We're right here at six to ten per thousand. OK. Here in the United States. And, you know, we're right around, you know, one to five in the other developed nations. OK. So we are almost. You know, I, this is going up. I wish in the United States this was this was uh, lower and it is actually going up. All right. And I don't like it. Um, so population changes results of birth. Of, okay. The recent decades uh, following growth rates in many countries have led to overall decline in the global uh, growth rate. So we have done a good job. You can see here in this graph, we got the world growth rate, population growth rate. We had a, you know, it was increasing in the 1970s, and that's when that you know, population bomb came out of that book, and the big controversy started happening. Um, but we also started... Uh, getting into that demographic transition, which we'll talk about later. Uh, and oh, you know what also happened here in the United States is that we allowed, in 1970, we allowed women uh, that weren't married to actually have birth control. Unbelievable. It took until 1970 to let, let you have birth control. But that's another here, another there yet. So we can see that it has decreased um, down the world uh, growth rate. Okay? And this is a good, a good sign, all right? But you can see in the more developed regions, that's where their growth rate came. But in the less developed countries, it still has kind of stayed uh, steady, right? And we need to try to work on uh, this area. And these are the transitioning uh, nations like China and India and Bangladesh, all those ones that want to become industrialized, all right? So we look at what's called the total fertility rate in demographics when we talk of population of humanity. And it is the average number of children born per woman during her lifetime, right? So if we take what's called the replacement fertility rate, total fertility rate, that keeps the size of a population stable for humans is about 2.1. So we want the total fertility rate of women to be about 2.1, and then we will be at what's called zero population growth. Okay, our, our growth won't get any bigger, it won't get any smaller, there won't be any uh, you know, growth to it. All right, and this is about where we are at here. We're at like 1.7 here in the United States, so we're a little bit low, less than replacement rates, right? When it comes to our natural born you know, citizens, okay? That's not counting immigration and immigration. But we're not alone in that statistic. A lot of the developed nations, like uh, in Europe and Australia and Japan especially, um, that whole thing has you know, happened a long time ago. We'll talk about that during the demographic section, demographic shift that we'll talk about here soon. Uh, nearly every European nation has a total fertility below their, their replacement rate, okay? So... The United States is, is getting real is is right there too, uh, and that's you know you can make up your mind on what you, whether or not you think that's good or bad. All right, it is what it is, and it's your job to put your ethics uh, towards that. All right, and I think we're doing just fine. So um, I don't know. You can make up your own mind. The number is the number. So worldwide, about 2015, 84. Uh, in, in, worldwide in 2015, 84 countries have fallen below the replacement fertility rate. All right, so you can see that Africa is doubling it here. All right, 4.7 is their total fertility rate. Okay, um, Australia is, I think Australia is actually lower, uh, but the South Pacific is the one that's keeping us at 2.3, but it's very close to the total fertility rate. All right, uh, Latin America and Caribbean, it's amazing that they are um, at the total fertility rate right there. Uh, and you can see here, like I said, we are at 1.7. So this is North America includes Canada, right? So we're at 1.8, and then Europe is at 1.6. So we are not even, and this is no immigration or immigration. This is just the deaths per naturalized citizen, okay? Industrial countries tend to have the highest life expectancies. Um, increases due to the drop of infant mortality and life expectancy. Okay, so they, you know, we live longer. Here in the United States, uh, we live till males about uh, 78, I think, and females around 83. 
All right, and believe it or not, our life expectancy rate, I think it might have ticked back up a little bit, but it has ticked down in the recent uh, couple uh, years, all right? Um, and you can do some research on why you think that that might be, all right? But you'll see our industrialized countries. And then we talked about that uh, in Zimbabwe uh, in uh, Africa, where their uh, life expectancy, the average age someone's supposed to live to is like 45 or 50. All right, and that's because they have the AIDS epidemic. All right, these children are born with the AIDS virus already in them, and they're you know you living with a death sentence. And remember, AIDS doesn't necessarily kill you; it just stops your body from being able to defend against things like uh, the flu or gangue fever and stuff. And that's what you really die of. Uh, it in, it diminishes the immune system. All right, so you're not dying of AIDS; you're dying of something else, but your body can't defend against it. And these children are born that way, and they can only, you know, the chances of you getting sick by the time you're 50 is pretty darn good. All right. So countries are still industrializing will pass uh, through a series of stages of economic culture changes called demographic transition. This is what we're going to finish on here. And this is a very important uh, thing because this is the history. All right. So we can look through all of the industrialized nations and see how their population has changed over time and then apply that knowledge uh, to the third world countries that want to, you know, quote unquote, be like us, all right? And in my humble opinion, we can get them there, and we could do this in a sustainable way. They actually have, they could leapfrog over all the industrialized, you know, all the stuff that we, all the mistakes we made, all right? They can go right to solar. They can go right to wind. They can go right to biofuels that we're talking about in the energy section, okay? They can do this kind of stuff. Lickety split, all right? Um, that having said that, you know, the transition that we went through in the United States and in Europe and, you know, the industrial, you know, becoming developed nations the way we are today has been a wonderful process. And I'm grateful for fossil fuels and everything that's, you know, happened. And like I said, you know, I wouldn't be alive right now. I might be alive. I would definitely be in a wheelchair and uh, in a diaper. All right. If it wasn't for, you know, I had a tree fall on me. If it wasn't for the technology. I wouldn't be able to do half the things I'm able to do, all right, uh, which is a wonderful thing, okay, keep me alive, I appreciate it, so I can bore you with these, uh, you know, uh, PowerPoints here, okay, so this is the basic uh, demographic transition, all right, so it starts with a pre-industrial stage, all right, where death rates, all right, and birth rates are kind of, you know, they're both high, all right, but they kind of equal. This is like the carrying capacity, right? This is the, the average, you know, you know, to keep the population going. I shouldn't say carrying capacity. It just it was, you know, even population growth rates, birth rates, and death rates equaled each other, and we kept the population stable during this time, all right? And especially in the United States and in the developing world, all right? You know, people got compensated for higher infant mortality by having many more children, all right? And birth control definitely wasn't available at that time either, all right? But, you know, population growth was basically stable during the pre-industrial uh, stage, all right? Then all of a sudden, we went into the transitional stage, okay, into this little area here, where the death rates declined during this stage due to improved food production and health care. But the birth rates remained high in the society and yet adjusted for new economic conditions. So the overall population rate uh, um, got very, very high. So you can see here was the birth rate that stayed constant, all right? But all of a sudden, we started having this technology keeping people alive. Older people grew, you know, people didn't live to 70. They lived to 80 now, all right, or 60 and to 80. And the infant mortality rate also decreased. So we have a lot more births, all right, people staying alive, while the, uh, the births are the same, all right, and the death rate decreases. And the births are the same, you know, you just think about society. They didn't know yet that if their kids were going to actually make it, all right? And then all of a sudden they turn around and the grandparents are living longer too, all right? And it takes a while for society to understand that and ingrain that, you know, it takes a couple generations per se it took us generations to digest that uh feeling all right that it's going to be okay we don't need to have the replacement you know that income later on all right we you know it's not all just about health it's also about income later on so 
what I mean by that was we have the social, a lot of the developed nations, including us, we have social security, right? Meaning that when you retire, you have a, a pension, you get a uh, social security check. You can, you know, whatever you worked is put away for you and saved. And then later on, when you retire, you have a certain stream of income. Now I don't have to rely on my daughter to uh, provide for me later on in life, right? I have all that income that I saved up while I was teaching you here at Robert Morris. You know, I got more than that too, the 401k and stuff. But at least we have that basic social safety net, right? To provide you for food and water and housing when you get older. All right, they're helpful. And, you know, we can talk about what social security, if we're gonna make it, if you're gonna get it or not, all right? But you will, okay? We just got to change some things, All right? That's not that's an economic uh, decision, not a uh, environmental one. But it does help out with the birth rate, all right? It definitely has that feeling of ah, uh, that ease helps out with uh, decreasing the uh, birth rate. And you can see when it gets into the industrial stage, they start to let's go to the next slide. They start to uh, say, okay, everything's going to be okay, and you see the dramatic decrease with the birth rate. All right. So during the industrial stage, employment opportunities increase for women. Birth control becomes more widely available and decreasing birth rates. All right. So, yeah, you know, like I said, birth control was available to, to uh, married women in the 1970s in the United States. It didn't become the single woman until freaking, you know, 1970s. Unbelievable. All right. Um, so, you know, that's one big thing as well. All right, it's just not always the medical stuff, but the birth control is definitely a good thing. All right, and you can see down at the bottom there that at the post-industrial age, where we are in the rest of Europe and stuff, it is that it becomes flat again. Right, we never really go up and we never really go down. Right, so right now, like I said, we're at like 1.7 here in America, so we're down underneath the line, and someday maybe we'll go back up, and someday we'll maybe we'll go back down. All right. But as long as we have a feeling of society that our needs are met and our children are going to make it, all right, we don't need that extra income, everything's going to be okay, we will just kind of flatline. All right? And they say the UN and we're going to be at 13 billion people. I don't know if we'll ever get there. All right? I think we will flatline around 8, maybe 10 billion people, somewhere around there, um, because everybody will start having you know, hopefully, you know, the infant mortality rate and, uh, uh, you know, people will be able to live a little bit longer also in these nations and they'll feel this ease that we did and will come down. And this is happening a lot faster in, uh, in a lot of areas. And it's basically kind of inevitable, right? So the demographic transition has occurred in Europe and Canada, U.S., Japan. We can see this all over the country, the same kind of graph. Uh, shows up all over the world in every one of those countries. So some developing countries are, are so overpopulated that they uh, may not be able to complete this transition, though, creating a uh, what's called demographic fatigue, right? So many sub-Saharan African countries give their highest populations and prevalence of HIV are in this uh, position, okay? So what we mean by this is, you know, the developing countries are have too many people, and they can't produce enough stuff to keep them going, all right? They're just in a dilemma where they're kind of stuck. They don't have enough income to build out the infrastructure and make it a, a better country, and it is just dragging down their, their resources. And then once those people get to be working ages, all right, um, they're dying off, all right? So you got a lot of younger kids, and no one really up there in the in the working age because they all have this pe uh, the prevalence of um, AIDS that they're not being able to um, do uh, the middle class kind of middle work that needs to be done. Uh, there are many economic and social factors that affect fertility in a nation. Okay, so it's access to contraceptives, uh, acceptance of contraceptives use, uh, level women's rights. This is probably one of the biggest. Uh, factors ever, all right? Um, I'll say this so many times that, you know, women, empowering women, all right, meaning having them be able to have a kind of contraceptives and uh, make up their own choices, what they want to do with their body and stuff, all right, is very important to see that population decrease because, like I said, it's, you know, not only about um, uh, 
medical advances keeping us alive a lot longer. It's not only about um, you know having a source of income when we're older or not having to have as many kids to support us, right? But giving women empowerment, you know, you know, and the right to contraceptives in 1970 dropped dropped our growth population numbers down in half. I think. I mean, they just plummeted. Because we actually, single women were allowed to have contraceptives, okay? Um, getting able to, for women to actually vote, all right? Because you can see that in some nations, it's a little bit different. Um, they might have all the income and high, you know, all this great technology, uh, but unfortunately, women don't have the rights, and their total fertility rate is, is huge. If you look at some of the... Uh, the uh, Middle Eastern countries, Saudi Arabia and stuff, women don't have as much rights as they have here in the United States. And their total fertility rate is huge. And they got all the income in the world and still got great uh, health care and all this other stuff, right? But the women's rights are lagging. And hopefully that will change, right? Because they were, I think they're able to finally drive in Saudi Arabia now. So, um, you know, I, it, that is our key, women's rights, baby. Power, hashtag power to the women, all right? Cultural influences such as television programs, uh, you know, control population size, uh, level of aff affluence, um, meaning if you have more power and more income, you're going to be able to, uh, to live a little bit longer because, and not worry about um, your kids taking care of you, all that other stuff. The importance of child labor, and we went from agrarian society to industrial society. And yes, we used our kids in the, in the labor force for a while in the early part, uh, but sooner or later, we didn't need to have our kids working there. We stopped our kids from working, and we kind of put up some laws that say they can't, all right? They need to be in school, okay? Uh, but there's still some countries that need that, all right? And still some agricultural countries, you know, agrarian societies, we should call them, um, that use child labor on the farm. There's nothing wrong with that, okay? As long as they're still getting some education, I think. Um, availability of government support for retirees. And this is the Social Security thing. Okay, and the Medicare and all this other stuff that we have here in the United States. That's what's really made um, the uh, things possible out there. Okay. So family planning is that family planning is an effort to plan the number of spacing of one's children. So, um, you know, when you have decide to have a family, you, you talk it over, hopefully with your uh, partner and you guys can decide uh, how many kids you want you know me and my wife we had a nice little family planning conversation that was it was pretty interesting and um we decided you know we were going to have like three or four kids and you know more like we ended up having three uh, but we wanted to practice as much of course as possible but uh, we decided to have that so i have that conversation over with your family all right also there's birth control which includes all efforts to reduce frequencies of with um uh, Frequencies of pregnancies, all right, so birth control is available to you out there um, nowadays, which I which I really appreciate that we have this accessibility, all right, and birth control comes in a lot of different things, all right, so sometimes we call them contraceptives, which is the deliberate attempt to prevent pregnancies, all right, so you don't get pregnant, um, that's what a contraceptive is, um, and there's family planning organizations out there that will help you with this, okay, in the United States, the most popular one, um, because they're probably one of the best services out there, is called uh, Planned Parenthood. Okay, and you can find that in the um, in the yellow pages. They're all over the place. All right, I know they sometimes get a bad rap from uh, the world out there, uh, but in my humble opinion, they do a really great job. All right, and they've never really done anything wrong. It's just sometimes people just don't like the abortion issue, all right? And they were one of the abortion providers out there. Uh, but they follow the law, all right? And in America, abortion is legal, and um, as long, you know, that's what the law is. You, you have the right to choose. And there's only certain times you can, all right, have an abortion. You can only do it up to, I think, in Pennsylvania, it's 21 weeks. There's, there's a cutoff, all right? And that cutoff is based on science, I guess. All right, it's based that um, the baby can live with outside the womb after a certain amount of weeks, 21 weeks, 23 weeks, one of the two. I think that there's a, you know, gray area in there. All right, it depends on what state you live in. All right, so if you ever hear any politician tell you that people are getting abortions all the way up to nine months, that's crazy. 
All right, that's not happening. If someone has something, a procedure like that done, it is a heart-wrenching decision because that baby is malformed and probably not going to live a couple, more than a couple days outside the womb because it like has no kidneys or something like that. It's very, you know, I couldn't imagine going through something like that. All right. Uh, but it is what it is, folks. Okay. Uh, the rates of use of range uh, of contraceptives. Uh, range from about 84% in China and the UK, less than 10% in some African nations. All right, so I think we have around an 85% usage of contraceptives here in the United States too. And it's getting a little bit better. All right, um, access, uh, but there's always going to be a big debate about you know whether or not we should use this. And watch for Planned Parenthood to be in the, in the news again sometime. All right, um, and watch how they handle it because they've handled every one of their so-called uh, controversies. Uh, very well. I've been very proud of that organization of how they handle uh, handle their stuff. Okay, uh, but there's other places out there too besides Planned Parenthood. So if you are someone that is inclined to not support abortion or whatever, um, you can go to another clinic to get uh, other help that don't do that. All right. So uh, they're not the only one out there. There's the biggest one in the United States and found all over. Okay, so access to family planning gives women our control over their reproductive window at the time which they can become pregnant. That's what we want to do. We want to be able to empower women to make the decision. Of course, the man is involved too. And, you know, you need to discuss these things, all right? As guys need to wrap that rascal as well, okay? Uh, but we need to really respect and empower women to say, okay, you know, I, I don't really want to get pregnant now, okay? Um, so that's you know, that's what it is. It's about empowering women, for sure. All right? And we can see this in this little graph here. So in order to reduce fertility rates, women must be given equality in decision-making power, right, and access to education and job opportunities. That is the best way to make things happen, okay? So here we see in this graph, we got the total fertility rate, Okay? Going up here on the y-axis. And the x-axis is secondary enrollment in school percentage. Okay? From 0% to 100%. And we can see right here in Jamaica, they have 90% of the women in secondary school, meaning high school. Right? And they're at 3 or 2.7 or what, something like that. All right, Vietnam, you had 60%. So the higher clusters right here of more women in uh, high school end up having a lot less kids. All right, and you can see here in Ethiopia, only about 10% of women go to high school. All right, so in these countries, the women, you know, the reason why women don't go into uh, high school is due to the fact that it is uh, not free. You got the, the people, the society actually has to pay for it. Okay, and that costs money, and they want to just send their males to high school and pay for their education because it's a better source of income generation later on in life, which is another issue, right? So the women don't even get educated, and they can't get educated and can't get the good jobs. Talk about non empowering women, right? Uh, one of my favorite uh, Charities. I'll have to give a quick aside. Is the is the um, Kind Fund Kids in Need of Desks. All right. So this guy Lawrence O'Donnell um, buys desks and gives them to uh, schools all over Africa because these people are actually learning on you know dirt floors. It's amazing. Okay. And you can see when he passes out those desks, man, those kids are just happy as all can be. Uh, but you can also from that through that same society is. Um, give a woman uh, a high school education and buy, pay for her tuition, right, um, to send her to um, high school, okay? And not until these societies change this and start empowering these women are they going to get their total fertility rate down, okay? That's just, you know, it's a known fact, okay? Can you see here also that the, the poor societies tend to have the higher populations rates than wealthier ones. So income and being affluent and being able to uh, say, hey, I'm going to be okay later on in life, you can see that the income, you know, this is the projected growth of the uh, population. You know, Asia, Latin American, Caribbean, kind of in the middle here. Uh, that's at one 
0.2% maybe, North America at half a percent, okay, North America includes Canada, and Europe, you know, almost down to zero, right? But you can see, you know, the income is a lot higher than down here in Africa, where they're only making five grand a year, right? And their population growth rate, this isn't the total fertility rate, right? This is the total population growth rate is going 2.5% a year. So you take that number, you divide that by 70, all right, and then you get the doubling of that population here, 1.5 or 0.5 divided by 70. We get the, pop, the double uh, effect, right? So income definitely helps out, right? So poverty uh, exacerbates population growth, all right, uh, due to, you know, all those all those pronatal pressures, you know, they don't have the income when they get older. Also, there's going to be a lot of fertility rates, uh, infant mortality rates, all right, no access to contraceptives, all those different things, no empowerment of women, okay? So most of the next billion people added to the human population will come from developing countries, okay? And developing would mean countries like China, India, um, Africa, all right? Uh, or Africa as a continent. Okay, let me free phrase that. So these countries will continue to be economically strained and the environmental de degradation will continue due to this poverty. All right, so you can see the expected uh, population in Africa in 2016 is going to be 1.2 bill 1 billion today. All right, or in 2016, by 2050, it's supposed to be over 2 billion. Look at Asia. All right, Asia is already at 4 billion. Holy guacamole. This is India, this is China. Uh, India and stuff, it's supposed to be over 5 billion, okay? North America, we're still going to include Canada and I think sometimes Mexico. I don't know if they included it in this chart or not, uh, but you can see we're not even close to getting to a billion. We're well, about 328 million here in the United States, all right? And you can see Europe, nice and even. It's supposed to even look, if you look closely, they're supposed to actually decline in the population growth, all right? But they're a lot more developed. They've been around a lot longer. Well, Asia, China's been around a long time. They've had a nice society. It just hasn't been inclusive, uh, meaning they weren't global, right? They were kind of shut off from the world for a while. But that's all right. They're coming around, and we're working together, I hope. Okay? So wealth can produce even more uh, severe environmental uh, impacts than poverty, though. Right? So the affluent is built on unsustainable levels of resource consumption. All right. So the addition of one person in a wealthy family like in the U.S. has the same impact of three or four Chinese, eight Indians, or 14 Afghanistan, Afghanis. So that's why we're doing this ecological footprint stuff, right? So our consumption, you can see through our consumption, the ecological footprint, we take up, we use more productive biocapacity space than anybody else. And that is what's causing this overshoot, all right, of... What we're, of carrying capacity, okay? And sometimes we have to say, hey, maybe we need to cut back, okay? But we have technology and stuff. I don't say we have to go back to the Flintstone age, all right? But sometimes some of our consumption can be a little bit uh, greedy, all right? So the American resident uh, economic activity, about $56,000 a year, footprints, eight, 2.2 hectares and 17 metric tons, where you look at somebody in India, they make about five or six grand a year, 1.2 heck acres is a footprint, and only about 1.7 metric tons. Look at that, 1.7 metric tons compared to our 17 metric tons in CO2. Unbelievable, all right? Well, 5% of the world's population, we use 25% of the world's resources. Oh, man, love it. Love my US of A. So the amount of biological productive land available is called biocapacity. All right, uh, the ecological footprint. So if human ecolo ecological footprint exceeds the biocapacity, is termed overshoot, and which leads into um, ecological deficit. All right. So if these footprint is less than the biocapacity, then there's an ecological reserve. And here we go. All right. So we see business as usual. We're already at overshoot. All right. So here was the basic, you know, carrying capacity. Okay, this little line right here and in the 1970s we kind of went over here and all the way up if we keep on going we're going to be in big 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 trouble so if we want to get back to sustainability we need to decrease our ecological footprint and leave us a little bit of ecological reserves 
and live to live sustainably. Right? Especially if we're going to want to have 10 billion to 13 billion people here on this earth. Okay? Because this is not sustainable. Alrighty. Let us uh, call that enough for the population section. Alright, so I will probably be getting out your midterm grades here shortly. I've been trying to grade as much as I can um, so I can get you a good grade out. Uh, I think they're due by the 28th, which would be uh, for a while. I think that's like a Monday or something. Let me if I get it there. Yeah, oh, I just had it. That would be Wednesday. So I'll probably get them out. I still have like a one more person that hasn't taken the test and stuff like that. So I've got a couple more things and I want to get some more assignments graded for you. Uh, but I'll have them out by the 28th for you. Okay? All right, everybody. If you have any questions, just let me know. If not, have a good day and we will be talking to you uh, shortening.